Let me just summarise where we've come to and then uh, just take 20 minutes or so to, uh, to just flag a number of sort of rules of thumb that we can use when reading the parables and interpreting the parables today and then we'll have some time for, for questions. What I've said so far then is that Jesus used parables for these three reasons. They function to reveal the reality and the character of God's rule for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. They were capable of subverting people's defences, of evoking responses from people that disclosed where their hearts were really at, where their value system was really at. And it's not accidental, I think, that those who sometimes were most resistant to the challenge of Jesus' parables were those in positions of power who had most to lose by taking seriously the kind of reordering of priorities that the parables implied. And then thirdly, the parables empowered personal transformation. They brought a new experience to birth in people's minds and people's, uh, people's um, understanding. Right, <clears throat> let's just then think about how when we read the parables today in our, in our Bible study groups or in our, uh, our own reading, how we should go about interpreting them. And these are just my suggestions, um, many other things could be said, but I think these are some helpful guidelines that uh, are pretty simple um, and can keep us hopefully on the right track. First, like all stories, the parables usually have a central or governing theme, a, major, a master idea, a master concept that they are trying to put across, even if commentators will sometimes disagree on what it is. But usually it's more or less obvious. The parable of the unforgiving servant is about forgiveness. That's not too hard, is it? Uh, it's about the dramatic forgiveness of God and it's about how that dramatic forgiveness ought to be expressed in our own relationships. The parable of the buried treasure is about finding something of immense value. The parable of the good Samaritan is about showing compassion to those in need, even if they come from the wrong side of the railway tracks. The parable of the prodigal son is about reconciliation and grace and forgiveness and so on. So it's not always difficult to work out what the master idea in the parable is. And uh, Luke if we find it hard, Luke sometimes helps us by telling us what he thinks the theme of the parable is. So Luke 18, Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to, get, not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who feared neither God nor had respect for people. So Luke says, here's my sort of tip off, this story is about prayer. Or Luke 18, he told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. So the parable is about arrogance and self-righteousness. So that's the first point. Let's try to identify the main theme in the story. Secondly, it's usually important for us to clarify the cultural points of reference that the story employs. The primary goal of interpretation, at least these days, it hasn't always been and it need not be, uh, as we'll see in a moment, the, 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 the most common strategy that Christian interpreters have used down the centuries to understand scripture is allegory, to sort of see them as sort of alleg allegories of spiritual truths with sort of a deeper mystical level of meaning. Uh, but for those of us sort of born after the 17th century, uh, historical understanding is the way we operate. We like to, th we think in terms of historical consciousness. And so the first goal of interpretation, at least for us moderns, is to try and understand how these things would have been understood by their first hearers. To try and put yourself back into the shoes of the people who had the story told to them in the first century. Because the parables draw on the everyday world of people in the first century, we need to sort of grasp the cultural points of reference that the story uh, is working with and that the first hearers would have instantly understood, and, and some of which we can still easily understand and others of which we, we struggle. The fact that farmers sowed their fields before they ploughed 
Now we do it the other way around, not that I've ever done it myself, but farmers today plough the field, then they sow. But it's the other way around in the ancient world, which is why when the person scatters the seed and then discovers that the soil's crap, because the plough went in later. The fact that harvests and weddings and wine were sort of standard Jewish symbols for the end of the age. This was a way of talking about the end of the age when God would uh, bring his reign. Or the fig tree in the vineyard are kind of stock metaphors for the people of God. So when Jesus tells stories about fig trees and vineyards, people would already be primed to recognize the metaphorical associations with Israel. Or that in the first century, lamps were put under baskets in order to extinguish them, to starve them of oxygen. Uh, or that the mustard seed was thought proverbially to be the smallest of all the seeds. I understand it's not, but proverbially it was thought to be the tiniest of all the seeds that we know of. Or that indebtedness drove many people off their land and into, to money lenders. That tax collectors were the lowest of the low in social and religious status in the first century. And so on and so on and so forth. Just to understand the kind of themes of everyday life that the parables work with. Now you say, well where do I get that knowledge from? Well you, we, we have to get it from the books. We need to go to the commentaries and to the uh, textbooks that tell us of the first century. And the reason why it's worth knowing is because this kind of cultural material, background material, will help us to recognise the surprising, unexpected, shocking, scandalous, um, upending details in the story that I, I spoke of before. But again, we unfortunately need the specialists to point this out to us. Thirdly, identifying the audience that the story is addressed to is also very helpful. The parables are sometimes addressed to the crowds, sometimes addressed to Jesus' religious opponents, and sometimes they are addressed to the disciples. And not infrequently, all three groups are present in some way. But sometimes the parables are told in a way that will target a particular audience, that will catch a particular audience out by the way the story is told. Let's take, for example, the best known of the parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You probably know this well. Let me just quickly read it to you. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Go to the top of the class. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, but who precisely is my neighbour? Jesus replied, again, he replied not by saying, well, let's talk about it abstractly. Jesus replied by telling a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. By chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while travelling near, uh, travelling came near to him. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them, put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, Jesus said, do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, with the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, Go, you and do likewise. Now the parable is told to a lawyer, probably a Pharisee, although we can't be sure about that because the priests also had their legal specialists, but probably a Pharisee. 
who Luke calls a lawyer, who is testing Jesus in terms of his adherence to the Torah. He is presumably been seated amongst the people that Jesus has been instructing. And he rises in order to tap the extent to which Jesus is actually faithful to the Torah. But he poses the question in terms of what must I do to inherit eternal life. Presumably this was something that Jesus was well known for talking about. And it was a common theme of, of discourse at the time. So Jesus, tell me then, what do you think I need to do in order to inherit eternal life? So Jesus tells the story. And the details of the story are, I think, set up in order to, in a sense, catch this lawyer out or to, or to compel this lawyer to rethink his worldview. The way the story is told is angled to be particularly pertinent to a lawyer thinking about the Torah in the way he does. So the first characters who come across the victim are priestly types, temple officials who ignore the victim and pass by on the other side. Now, we don't know, but presumably the lawyer would have been disappointed that the priests had behaved that way, but probably not too surprised, because after all, they're priests. So this would have, in a sense, uh, pandered to the lawyer's existing worldview. You know, you thought, well, he probably thought, well, what do you expect? You know, priests have more important things to do. So his defences are subverted because initially it's almost reinforcing what he would expect to be the case. The lawyer would probably have thought that the next person down the street would have been an ordinary Israelite, a lay person, or possibly a Pharisee. That would have been really good, but certainly an ordinary Jewish person, not a, an ordained cleric who's responsible for temple performance, but an ordinary person. He'd have probably expected that because the phrase priests and Levites and all the children of Israel was a way of referring to the whole nation, kind of stock phrase. And he would have expected probably that this Israelite who came along the street would have done the right thing and shown mercy and compassion to the victim on the side of the road. Surprise number one is it's not a Jew who appears next in the story, but it's a Samaritan. So there's a shock. He would have probably thought, well, a Samaritan appears, he probably will go and pick this guy's pockets. Trouble is he's got no trousers on because he's been stripped naked. But if he had a, not that he wore trousers, if he had clothes on, you'd expect the Samaritan to do some dastardly deed to him. Lawyers, Jewish lawyers, Jews in general held Samaritans in utter contempt and Samaritans returned the compliment. So to have a Samaritan in the story was a shock, but you'd probably expect the Samaritan to be just another one of the robbers. Surprise number two is that Jesus turns the Samaritan into a hero in the story that reverses expectations, that sort of shocks and surprises by the goodness he shows. But surprise number three is when the lawyer is told to go and imitate the behaviour of a loathed enemy. Go you and do likewise. You want to know how to gain eternal life? Go and copy your enemy. That's pretty in the face. The whole story, in a sense, was set up, if you like, to force the lawyer to rethink his entire worldview. Because the lawyer, but when Jesus concludes by saying, well, tell me, which of the three acted like a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? There's only one answer possible. Because there's only one person in the story who acts like a neighbour. And so the lawyer is compelled to say, well, obviously the one who did mercy. And the one who did mercy happens to be an enemy who would not expect to perform such an act of compassion. And so the lawyer is actually you know, subverted, cornered almost, by the way the story is told, and profoundly challenged to rethink his value system, both because Jesus fails to use a Pharisee as the hero and because the one who fulfills the love commandment is somebody who the lawyer despised, who the lawyer held in utter contempt. So the strategy, the force of the parable, uh, is even more obvious when you realise that it's a particular audience that is being addressed.
Number four, the parables need to be related to Jesus' broader perspective on the kingdom of God. They are not just tales for putting across moral or spiritual truisms. They are an intrinsic aspect of Jesus' wider proclamation of the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to interpret the parables in a way that is consistent with Jesus' broader perspective on the kingdom of God. Makes sense. If the parables are about the kingdom, then we ought to interpret the parables in a way that makes sense of the other things that Jesus says about the kingdom. And just let me pick out three things about Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom that are relevant to interpreting the parables. We saw a couple of weeks ago that in his proclamation of the kingdom, Jesus appears to have taught a kind of inaugurated eschatology. In other words, he was announcing that God's kingdom had come, but only in an initial sense. The kingdom is being inaugurated. It wasn't yet here in its fullness. It was already here, but it was not yet here in its totality. And I just read this afternoon when I was at the airport, I'm reading a book by a scholar that we're actually bringing as a first, as a St. John's visiting scholar next year, uh, William Kavanagh, a brilliant Roman Catholic theologian uh, who's coming to Wellington uh, as a St. John's scholar. He's written a new book on, on, on uh, politics. But he made a suggestion in passing that the reason why the kingdom hasn't come in the fullness is not because God only intended to just sort of give a little taste of it, but because we haven't responded in the way that would enable the kingdom to come in the way that God intended. I don't know what I think about that, but it was just an interesting thought. But Jesus proclaimed the beginning of the kingdom, not yet the fullness of the kingdom. In light of that, the agricultural images that Jesus uses, like a seed planted in the ground, that's growing, although you might not be able to see it, it's putting roots down beneath the surface, but it's growing and will one day become a crop that we can harvest, captures this reality of the kingdom as something that has begun. The seed actually has been planted. The eagle has landed. The kingdom has made a beginning in the presence of Jesus. It's operating powerfully in the present like a seed is growing, charged with the power of growth, although you can't see it, but it's still there, and one day it will come in its fullness. So that understanding of the kingdom helps us to understand what these parables, particularly the agricultural parables, are about. Now the main emphasis of the parables, I think, is on calling people to recognise that the kingdom has begun, that the new reality is here. That the kingdom of God has broken into the human scene because of the coming of Jesus. It's not just a future dream to wait for in the far distant uh, future. It's already operative and importantly it's operative in the midst of ordinary everyday mundane life. God's kingdom, the reason why Jesus chose sort of such secular um, plot lines and imagery to use to talk about the coming of the kingdom in itself is important. The kingdom is to be found not in a series of spiritual activities, it's to be found in the midst of ordinary everyday life. God is at work in the midst of ordinary secular life. So there's no sort of spiritual secular dichotomy here. God's kingdom is at work in the midst of planting fields and throwing parties and travelling to towns and so on. The kingdom has begun, it's present. Open your eyes, open your ears in order to understand it. But it's not yet here in its fullness. Therefore, any interpretation of the parables that entirely spiritualises them or entirely in interiorizes them, just made up a new word, that, that, that takes them as stories about kind of inner experiences alone, my own private kind of uh, experience. Any interpretation that sees the parables as entirely about that is missing something important. The parables are about the kingdom of God. They're about what God is doing in the world. Something has broken in. It's begun and it's secretly at work. You need to open your eyes to see it and become part of it because one day it will actually fill the whole world.
Another feature of Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom that is relevant to the parables is that Jesus saw himself as the bearer of the kingdom. So you could say, well, when Jesus said the kingdom is present, well, where is it present? Well, it's present in Jesus. Jesus is the one who embodies the kingdom here and now in the presence. And those who connect with Jesus can begin to participate in this new reality. God's kingly power is uniquely concentrated in him. And so the parables have a kind of implied Christology. In other words, they imply something about the one who is telling the parables. He is the sower of the seed. He is the shepherd who goes looking for the sheep. He is the bridegroom who, 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 who throws the wedding party. He is the one who gives forgiveness. He is the judge. He is the king. He is the, uh, the landowner and so on. Jesus interestingly takes these Old Testament images that in the Old Testament refer to God and implicitly applies them to himself as the one who proclaims the kingdom. Therefore, any interpretation of the parables that reduces them to simple moral platitudes with no deeper significance about Jesus is also, I think, open to question. Thirdly, you may remember me uh, borrowing, as I always do, pinching this phrase, collaborative eschatology, from Crossan. Uh, it captures something, I think, very important about Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom. Remember that I use Mark 1.15 to uh, make this point. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The kingdom of God is at hand, therefore repent and believe. God is doing something, therefore you must do something. The, 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 imper the, uh, the uh, indicative, God is at work, and the imperative, you must respond to this in order to engage with it. The parables make this point over and over again. They tell of something that is happening and how people engage with it. The characters in the parables are always active. They're always doing something. They're harvesting, they're, they're, they're searching, they're plowing, uh, they're throwing a party, they're traveling, they're always active. They demonstrate that what God is doing requires a voluntary human response in order for it to sort of become lived experience. The kingdom is about divine human cooperation, which is why Kavanaugh's comment really struck me when I read it this afternoon, that God has brought the kingdom, but the reality still requires a voluntary human response. And maybe the fact that we don't respond uh, as we ought is one of the reasons why the kingdom appears to be uh, still so so initial rather than something uh, more dramatic. Number five, we need to avoid illegitimate allegorization. These simple charming stories that Jesus told have suffered a history of more misinterpretation than any other part of the Bible except the book of Revelation. That's probably the most misused and abused book in the New Testament. But second to that are the parables. The early church fathers got us off to the wrong foot by subjecting the parables to an allegorical interpretation. In allegorical interpretation, every minor detail of the story stands for, excuse me, stands for something profound. Let me read you the way that Oregon, or Origen, however you pronounce the G, uh, in the third century, allegorized the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of the early influential church fathers. The man going down from Jericho, Oregon said, is Adam. Jerusalem, from where he is going, stands for paradise. Jericho stands for this world. The robbers stand for the hostile influences and enemies of man. The wounds are disobedience or sin. The priest stands for the law. The Levite stands for the prophets. The good Samaritan stands for Christ. The beast is the body of Christ. The inn is the church. The two denarii are the knowledge of the Father and the Son. The innkeeper stands for the angels in charge of the church. And the return of the good Samaritan stands for the second coming of Christ. 
Later, Augustine, the greatest intellectual in the history of the church, probably uh, after Paul, also allegorized the parable in an even more fantastic way. The man going down from Jericho is Adam. Jerusalem is the city of heavenly peace. Jericho is the moon, which signifies our mortality. The robbers are the devil and his angels. Stripping the victim means taking away his immortality. Beating him was a way of talking about persuading him to sin. Leaving him half dead was that he was spiritually dead, but half alive to the knowledge of God. The priest is the priesthood of the Old Testament, the law. The Levite is the ministry of the Old Testament, the prophets. The good Samaritan is Christ. That standard in, in interpretation of this parable, the Good Samaritan, an image of Christ. I think you can make a good case for the victim actually being an image of Christ, but that's another story. The binding of wounds is the restraint of sin. Oil is the comfort of good hope. Wine is the exhortation to spirited work. The beast is the body of Christ. The inn is the church. The two denarii are the commandments of love. The innkeeper, wait for it, is the Apostle Paul, and the return of the Good Samaritan is the resurrection of Christ. That's allegory, right? And that kind of way of decoding the stories uh, persisted pretty well for 1,800 years. It was blown out of the water finally, although the Protestant reformers dismissed allegory, they still tended to allegorise the parables, but it was blown out of the water by a German scholar at the end of the 19th century called Adolf Ulicke, who launched a massive devastating attack on allegorisation and insisted that parables and allegories are t completely unrelated literary forms. And that whereas allegories have lots of associations, parables, he said, only ever make one point. And all the rest is just background detail. And so when you interpret the parables, Ulicka said, and the great 20th century scholars on the parables agreed, you should just look for one major message. And all the rest was just background detail. The relationship between parable and allegory has been re-evaluated in the last generation, and it's very complex territory. Uh, suffice it to say that we can't really radically distinguish between parables and allegories, that there is a kind of continuum between, put this up here, continuum between realistic reportage on the one hand and continuous allegory on the other, and the parables fall at different points along this particular spectrum. So some of the parables have more allegorical associations, like the parable of the sower, for example, which uh, Jesus goes through and says what, what the different points stand for. Other parables have much less uh, allegorical um, meaning to them. But there's still a place for a kind of moderate allegory in this sense. Jesus' first century Jewish hearers would have been predisposed to understand images of kings, judges, fathers, and shepherds as symbols for God. Vineyards, vines, fig trees, sheep as symbols for Israel. Enemy fingers, uh, fingers, enemy figures as symbols for the devil. Harvesting and grape gathering as symbols for judgment. Weddings, feasts, and festal robes as symbols for salvation. The prophets make use of this kind of symbolism. And so when Jesus makes use of the symbolism, we are entitled, I think, to make those kinds of associations. But there is no way in the wide world that Jesus' first century hearers could have thought of the Good Samaritan's donkey as a symbol for the body of Christ, or the innkeeper as a symbol for the Apostle Paul, who wasn't even on the map at that stage. They couldn't have made that association. They would have, that would have been totally foreign to their audience, and therefore I think we ought to avoid doing it. We, uh, I won't talk about that just for the sake of time, but uh, each gospel writer also has a particular attraction to, to certain kinds of parables. Mark loves nature parables. Luke loves parables of delay. Matthew, um, more gloomily, has parables of judgment, most of the very violent uh, images of you know, gnashing of teeth and so on you find in Matthew. But my final point is ready to come full circle and just to 
reiterate the fact that when we are reading the parables, we need to remember that they are, in the first instance, stories. They are stories that we are supposed to inhabit imaginatively. We are supposed to enter into the story as we do any other story and be emotionally and existentially engaged by what is being uh, disclosed. They are not, in the first instance, collections of moral or doctrinal propositions. Although we have long preferred to turn the stories into illustrations of abstract ideas. And the problem with that is that once you've got the idea, you don't need the story anymore. Once you have worked out what it's about, you can forget the story and just get on with having the principle. Who's that American guy who goes through and turns all these things into life principles? Bill Gothard, yeah. He's got how many, 20 or 30 or 40 life principles that he gets from the Bible. The problem with doing that is that once you've got your principles, you can forget the Bible because you've got, you know, you've got the pay dirt, so just forget the, forget the stories. Well, that's obviously not what we should do. The stories are to be experienced. They're not to be translated into propositions. We also need to avoid reading our later theological concerns back into the parables or using them to bolster our favoured theological systems. Unlike theological creeds, stories confront us existentially. They subvert our defences. They mediate encounter with the subject of the story and the storyteller. They operate at that level of experience, not at the level of sort of rational uh, propositions. Another key feature of stories, as of any work of arts, is work of art is their inherent ambiguity, or polyvalence is a, story, a term that's often used by uh, parable scholars. Yes, they have a dominant intended meaning that was particularly angled to catch out the audience that was first addressed by Jesus. Yes, we can say this parable is about this theme or this subject. This parable is about forgiveness. This parable is about, um, about compassion or whatever. Yes, we can do that. But the stories also have this surplus of meaning that I talked about at the beginning. They have this capacity to communicate additional levels of meaning or significance arising from the interaction of readers in different contexts and in different historical periods. It's a bit like if you go to a Bible study group and you sit around with 20 people reading a text and everybody tells you what they see in the text. And somebody sees something in a text that you would have never in a million years imagined was there. But when they say it, you say, yeah, that's right. I can understand that. That there's this surplus of meaning, this additional level of meaning that different readers will encounter. Jesus used these parables partly because they, oops, partly because they had this capacity to go on generating demands and challenges and meanings beyond even the, the dominant meaning he was trying to communicate. We can never exhaust their meaning or power. Now we are on kind of tricky territory here because on the one hand I think part of the magic of parables is that you can never tie them down to a single meaning. They will always go on subverting and challenging and surprising and shocking and evoking levels of thinking that, you know, that we didn't have before and levels of, of, of challenge we didn't recognise. Well, they'll always go on doing that. But to recognise that could be an invitation just to make the stories do whatever you want them to do. And all kinds of fanciful interpretations um, have been suggested. I remember feeling somewhat outraged, I must say, by reading an article on the parable of the prodigal son that I was working on by an American uh, New Testament scholar who suggested that the uh, reason why the, the prodigal son left home was because his father was a pedophile and he was running away from abuse. And this scholar admitted that this was probably not what Jesus intended, nor was it what the audience would have thought, but, and she said, as a professional biblical scholar, I can say it means this. She felt 
she had the permission as a professional biblical scholar to completely reverse the meaning of the story. And I felt cross. I felt cross because if you can do that, the parables actually lose their subversive power. If you can make the parable promote your own particular political agenda at will, the parable loses the power to challenge you. You become the one who's manipulating the story for your own agenda. And I think that's wrong. So it's delicate territory. On the one hand, yes, we can't exhaust these stories. They will go on challenging us. But we mustn't use that as an excuse to simply turn the stories into propaganda for our own particular purposes. One scholar has suggested that perhaps one way in which we could explore the richness of these stories is that when we hear them, we could consciously put ourselves in the position of different characters in the story. So when we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, maybe we should one time think of what it would have been like to have been the priest walking down the road. And instead of demonising the priest, think, well, this poor guy had a real problem on his hands because the Lord told him he must have no contact with the corpses of, the de of dead people. And yet here was somebody who might not be dead. Looked dead, but might not be dead. What do you do? And maybe, you know, to enter sympathetically into the world of the priest would give us a different way of experiencing the story. Or what would it be like to be the victim in the story? And to try and experience the story from the perspective of the victim. Or what would it have been like to be the innkeeper? Or the donkey, for that matter. If you really want to get into the power of the story to say surprising things. What would it have been like to have been the donkey that... The, <laughs> stupid, forget that. <laughs> or to hear the story from the perspective of the lawyer. Or the crowds who are listening in. Or the disciples who are listening in. That's one way it's been suggested of accessing some of the richness of these stories without it spinning out of control. And perhaps there are just a couple of safeguards that we should, we should always bear in mind uh, when, we, when we try to allow the richness of the story to, to, to go on speaking. One is that any additional meanings that we find in the story need to be consistent with the dominant meaning of the story. That's why the this, this scholar who said, no, this is perhaps a story of somebody escaping uh, family abuse, to me is inconsistent with the dominant meaning of the story. It actually reverses it. And so I think there's good reason to question whether that's an appropriate way to read the story. That you can read the story that way is obvious, because she does. That you ought to read the story that way is another question. And I would suggest you ought not to, because it's inconsistent with the dominant meaning. And any additional meanings that we find in the story, I think, need to have some grounding in the plot and characterization of the story. We can't imagine things that aren't present in the story. We can't sort of put different characters into the story uh, in order to find richness. We need, I think, to stick with the structure of the story. Right, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Yes. Um, Um, there, there, is a, there is a place, I think, in is it Mark 12, where the Pharisees, uh, it says the Pharisees understood the parable was about them, and they moved to try and silence Jesus. So I think sometimes his opponents recognised that they were being, uh, they were being attacked, um, metaphorically, <laughs> by these stories. Um, I guess... More generally, it was probably the same reality that surrounded the whole ministry of Jesus, which was they, they couldn't really understand it until the story had, had run its full course and, and, and Jesus had died and risen again. And then there was new eyes to see what was going on. So maybe there was a kind of partial insight on the part of people, but the full import uh, had to await the story playing out, I guess. I, I suppose that would be a general observation. I, 
was Kim Workman last night who last time rang me. Um, yeah, so I guess that would be a, a general comment. Whether there, I'm just trying to think whether there are other cases where we get uh, a sense that people really did latch on or or didn't. I mean, the disciples obviously scratched their heads. Why do you keep talking in parables? Um, why does everything come in parables? That's the phrase I use for the lecture. Yes. Yep, it is quite. It's quite. Um, it's quite common these days. Uh, modern interpreters are much more. I say modern within this last generation are much more attuned to the social and political realities of Jesus' ministry, and so what we have traditionally read as kind of. Um, contextless stories, I mean stories just about individuals doing things if you start to locate them in the, in the, in the social and political realities of the first century then maybe, you know, maybe some of the, the social structures that are being implied are more significant than we've recognised so uh, there's, a, there's a scholar called William Herzog who has written on the parables very much from this perspective again I find all that stuff very helpful but I, I also think it can it can easily become the tail that wags the dog, and that Jesus becomes. And the, uh, there are certain uh, New Testament scholars that I think are like this that turn Jesus into a first century Marxist, or a first century revolutionary, or a first century prophet for whom religious categories are just codes for political realities. And so Jesus is really not talking about what a real God is doing, but he's talking about the need to transform village life and to, you know, to overthrow the oppressive um, aristocracy and so on. So there's a, there's a slight, I have a, well, more than a slight caution, I have a significant caution about the tendency of some scholars to do that. Um, but on the other hand, I think we need, to, we need to factor in the fact that Jesus' stuff does have real political edge to it as well. So, for example, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, some have suggested that the hearers would have thought of the robbers as Robin Hood type figures. That you know these were these were good people who had been driven off their land by oppressive landlords, and the only way they could survive was to actually attack the wealthy people on the streets. And so, some have argued that the, the victim was probably a wealthy man who was attacked by these Robin Hood figures who were getting their own back. Um, again, I find, I find that just a bit fanciful, really, and a bit convenient. Uh, it plays to our own kind of instincts these days to sort of champion the little guy against the oppressive um, Sheriff of Nottingham type figures. But uh, it seems to me the story, the way that the robbers are portrayed implies that they are people who engage in acts of violence that are severe and we're not supposed to sympathise with them in that sense. But some, but some have read it in those terms. Right. Um, what about the parable of the assistant? Yeah. Widow? Yeah. What's your attitude? Right. Well, I, the, these, are, these are tricky. There are a couple of parables, and that's Luke 16 or 17 or 18 or somewhere in there, 18. A couple of parables there where um, some rather disturbing things happen. I mean, there's one of the, the parable of the guy who uh, is sacked because he's been cooking the books. Or he's, you know, he's been doing something and he's sacked, and so he cooks the books in order to try and get in, into the good, you know, to uh, the debtors of his master will actually give him a job when he's turned out. And um, it's quite unethical behaviour, and it becomes problematic when you think, well, how is this an image of, of God? Um, or, the, or the persistent widow who, who comes and pleads with his judge who's too lazy to do justice until he gets so annoyed at this woman who won't go away that he eventually gives her her cause. I, I think in that case that that's where we need to um, 
look for the dominant message of the parable and, and not to turn the parable into a parable about God. It's actually a parable about, about persistence in prayer. And I think in this case, the judge is probably not intended as an image for God who's reluctant to answer prayer. Um, it's more about persistence to get what you need and a preparedness to hang on even when things appear not to be going your way. So, I mean, these are all judgment calls, really, as to know just, just how to interpret it. But I, I think when Luke gives us a kind of clue with that one, that this is a parable about the need to be persistent in prayer, if we turn it into a parable about the nature of God, we're perhaps doing something that's not intended. So I don't think God or the judge is necessarily always an image for God, but often is. Ross. Um, yeah, were there superhero stories around um, in Jesus' time? And if so, when you see him and you use them, um, what's the significance of that? And, and then also, um, you know, if there's a bit more okay to use them these days. Superhero stories? Yeah. Um, well, certainly in, in sort of pagan mythology, there were lots of superhero stories. I, I, whether there was in Jewish tradition, I, I simply don't know. Uh, question times are very painful things for speakers, you have to know. Um, because people always ask questions that you don't know the answer to. And so you try and fudge it. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, the significance of the absence of a superhero, Superman, Batman, Captain America type figure, I think, is because Jesus is not talking about sort of vain utopian hopes. He's talking about something that he believes is actually happening in everyday reality, that God is at work. And I guess you could say the superhero has come to die. He's come to be crucified. He's come to serve. He's come to, you know, to not coerce. He's come to invite. And that the whole agenda of the kingdom is conditional upon people freely responding. I mean, it's, it's an incredible image of divine power really, that you find throughout the New Testament. So the absence of a superhero figure, I think, is because of the nature of the kingdom, the nature of God. God is somebody who comes as a servant, not as a, you know, not as a, um, as a Captain America figure who, who triumphs through superior violence. And that's the problem with these superhero figures, I think, is that the basic message of the superhero stories is that you win by having superior violent power on your side. It's, it's done for the good, of course, but basically it's having superior power. So the, the whole subversive nature of the power of the kingdom, I was in Nelson yesterday and last night, and I, I spoke this morning in Nelson on a passage from Ephesians 4, where Paul begins his appeal by saying, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you. And I was pointing out that the I is emphatic. I, it's me, Paul, speaking and I'm a prisoner for the Lord. But earlier in the epistle, he talks about the stupendous power that is able to accomplish more than you can ever ask or think, this immeasurable power that's been given to us. And he's in prison. What kind of power is that? It's not the power of coercion. It's the power you know, of love. It's the power of service. It's the power of appeal, of invitation, of, of weakness. It's this paradoxical power that is characteristic of the gospel and I think we find it in the stories of Jesus as well the power of the kingdom is the seed you know it's the woman baking uh, it, it, it's not it's not the messianic prince coming with 12 legions of angels to crush the Romans do I sound like a Mennonite <laughs> yes um, my question is more about the social context um, just for the Samaritan and the Rome, how would they have um, identified each other? Well, that's a very, that's a very good question. Um, he was, he was, he was naked, so there was no. Not that uh, it appears that Jews wore different kinds of clothes than Gentiles. The rich wore different clothes than the poor. Um, so even as clothing might not have given a signal, some have suggested that. Um, the Samaritan went and checked whether he was circumcised or not because that would have identified him as a Jew but Samaritans practiced circumcision as well so that would have been perhaps a sign of ethnicity 
But the whole story really depends on the fact that he was without any markers of identity at all. He was a mere human being. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as a part of the, of the result of the assault, he is stripped of every secondary distinction that exists. Race, class, ethnicity, wealth, religious status. Um, and the Samaritan shows compassion. So um, could the Samaritan have determined that this victim was a Gentile or a Samaritan rather than a Jew? Probably not. But he seems to have shown no interest in anything to do with this person, apart from the fact he was in need. Whereas for the priest and the Levite, of course, what was supremely important for them was that he was probably dead. So he was a source of contamination. Probably a Jew. It was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Almost certainly a Jew, um, but a, a potential source of contamination. Right. Well, that's a good that's a good way of putting it. Um, I guess it depends upon the kind of detail in your doctrine that you're trying to take from the parables. So, if, for example, we were to take every parable that mentions the judge as, or the king, the king who slaughters his opponents, and some of the parables, that this is an image of God, and we we abstract. Uh, these things from the parabolic context that tell us something about God, I think we get into all kinds of hot water. But on the other hand, I think you're right that our doctrine needs to be informed by the images of God and the images of salvation and the images of community that these parables convey. So, you know, the, the, the doctrine of God that we have, of the unmoved mover and, the, you know, that kind of, the, 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 the severe sovereign um, overlord that is, is, is so strong in a, in a lot of Christian theology, needs to be informed by the fact that Jesus tells us God is like a woman baking bread. God is like a shepherd who goes looking for a lost sheep. God is like somebody who plays a flute and waits for children to dance. God is like a prodigal, a father who embraces his rebellious son who's been deeply injured by his son's action and yet shows no concern. That's what God is like. So that should inform our doctrine. That's a, I, mean, I think it's a very helpful way to put it. But not to, not to abstract ideas out of the parables that are purely doctrinal in some sort of decontextualized sense. Hmm. And the same could apply to our ethics. Our, the parables need to inform our ethics. But again, we, so much of this stuff is about an art rather than a science. You know, it's not that there are rules that we can follow and, hey, presto, we get the right answer. It's about learning to be a wise reader of Scripture. And a wise reader of Scripture is one who, you know, over a long time of effort and of learning and of prayer and of spirituality sort of learns to balance these things and to, and to make wise judgments. Not judgments that you can sort of scientifically verify, but judgments that are, you know, that are cons consistent with what we know God to be like. Can't be proven in any kind of abstract sense, but ultimately strike the community of believers as being right, being true. Any more? No more. Right, thank you. Um, next week is discipleship. Uh, so these all sort of build onto each other. But thank you for your very uh, close attention. See you next week.